Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning. And I am, uh, we have a few people who are still coming in. There's a little mic, Mitchell, there's some feedback on this mic. So um, Mitchell is controlling everything in the booth back there and managing the Zoom um, option for the people who have logged in online. So we're just glad to see all of you here this morning. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I'm director of plan giving here at Torrance Memorial. And uh, we're happy to be able to bring you this seminar series called Taking Care of Your Financial Health. Can you all hear me? Now I feel like it's not loud enough. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Good. So um, we, uh, the, we have help with this seminar with our Professional Advisory Council, which is a group of estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, professional fiduciaries, a life care manager, and uh, they all help to uh, support the hospital and also to educate with these seminars, uh, which we hold every other month on the second Saturday, and uh, we want to help educate the community and help you uh, all understand about estate planning and charitable giving and the tax benefits of all of that. So that is um, what happens here. And um, we, uh, I, I already said thank you to Mitchell. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, get going with the day. If you have a cell phone, I would ask that you make sure it's in silent mode so that it doesn't interrupt. The restrooms are through the door there in the in the back corner. So if you need to do that, you should have all received a door prize ticket when you came in. We've had uh, some gift cards donated by one of our PAC members who is uh, Maureen Dearden. And uh, she's a business analyst. And so she's donated some of those for us to uh, share with you. And we will draw that at the end. And you do have to be present to win. So hopefully you all stay until the end. Uh, you should have received some handouts when you came in, the PowerPoint and an evaluation form and a flyer for next month. We do pay attention to your comments on the evaluation form, so do take a minute at the end to fill that out, and you'll leave that on the table in the back. Um, we also um, can use that if you want to be able to receive all of our email updates and uh, get the information on future events. Uh, just include that on there, and uh, if you can make a note to me too to please add your email to the list, that's helpful. We have index cards on each of the tables, so if you have a question during the presentation, you can perhaps please write that down and write clearly for us so we can read that. And uh, we will leave about 20 minutes at the end of the seminar to handle all of the questions. For those of you on Zoom, we uh, you have you can use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen and uh, and submit your questions there and we'll include as many of those as we're able to do so how many of you are here at this seminar series for the very first time do you raise your hands oh that's great it's always good to see new folks in the audience and uh, we always love to see our repeat attenders too so thanks for being here and joining us on saturday morning I always like to feature a few other of the events and, and lectures we have. On the third Wednesday of every month in the evening, we have our health education lecture. It's called the Miracle of Living series. And for any USC fans, you're gonna wanna come on May 15, that's next Wednesday, because we have a special guest speaker, um, Dr. Arthur Bartner. He's the retired director of the, the Trojan Marching Band. And uh, he's going to come and talk about, he's in his 80s, and so the title of the lecture is Marching On, Aging Successfully Today. So that will be a very interesting talk, and um, we also have some vendor tables that will be open at 5.30, and then at 6.30 the lecture starts. It is also available on Zoom for those of you who prefer that. We also have a Medicare 101 class monthly, which is also on a Wednesday. It's the fourth Wednesday at 6.30. That one is all on Zoom, but it's very helpful to understand what Medicare is all about. You know, it's more complicated than it, it seems like it should be with all the different plans and the different things that are available. So our Torrance Memorial IPA group does that Medicare 101 session. So you can uh, participate in that as well and learn about that. So I always like to talk a little bit about something that's going on here at Torrance Memorial, and I, 
I put up a, a campus map because our, our campus has grown over the years. So about six years ago, we affiliated with Cedar sinai And that affiliation has been so beneficial for the hospital. It has allowed us to have some high level surgeons and uh, doctors here like the neurologists, um, the cardiologists. We do a lot of clinical trials through our oncology unit and that's all in partnership with Cedar sinai and uh, they also have helped us with some of our capital projects like the building we have in el segundo it was with their you know help we were able to build that it has an urgent care and a lot of physician offices and the other thing that happened a couple years ago is they purchased these two buildings david buxton owned those buildings and he wanted to retire so he we were they were able to buy the 3400 and 3440 tormed buildings they're called so now that's part of our campus too so we, um, you know, that, that provides a lot of great opportunities for future growth. And, uh, you know, at some point right now, we're, our ER is very busy. We're on track to see 106,000 patients in our ER. And, um, and uh, the hospital beds are full. So there's the continued need for, uh, for space and for hospital um, for that to, to happen. So, that's what's happening on our campus. And then I wanted to show you our latest rankings, US News and World Report and Newsweek always, they do surveys of doctors and patient experience and whatnot. And you see that here we rank as um, for US News and World Report, we're ninth in California and fourth in the LA metro area. So we're right up there with the teaching hospitals of, of Cedars and Keck USC, and then Newsweek um, has ranked us at number 10 and, uh, and in California and number 40 in the US. So we're really proud of those rankings and what we've been able to offer to our community right here in the South Bay. And uh, so those are, are some um, wonderful things. And you know, I mentioned the teaching hospitals and just I'll talk about this maybe next month, but we are working on creating a rotation here for some of the residents that are part of Cedar sinais academic program. And they will be coming to Torrance Memorial to do some rotations here too. So it's very exciting that we're, we're moving into that particular arena. So I have a little video to show. It was made a couple years ago by, um, for the magnet designation. Magnet is related to our nursing system here. And it's called We Are Torrance Memorial. So take a look at this. Torrance Memorial was founded in 1925 and has been serving the South Bay community for over 95 years. The employees, physicians, nurses, and volunteers of Torrance Memorial support our mission through a set of core values, which guide our care teams to promote the recovery and healing of our patients and their loved ones. Our mission is to improve the community health by offering the most current and effective medical treatment and technologies rendered in a compassionate and caring manner. The community of Torrance Memorial Medical Center recognizes that our commitment to our patients and their loved ones, our healthcare team, the general public, and to each other make Torrance Memorial Medical Center a warm and caring part of the South Bay Peninsula community. We share a common value for the worth of each person and a common goal of providing quality healthcare services. We are devoted to a healthcare team approach in delivering patient care offering support to our patients and their loved ones. We are proud to support the community as first responders, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic where our efforts were especially recognized, but throughout the year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that helps you to see too why we're ranked as high as we are. It's a, it's a really a great, uh, medical center here in our community that's that's here to serve you. So I always like to, um, I mentioned I'm director of plan giving and so plan giving is those kinds of things that you include in your estate plan to help benefit the hospital. And these are some of the common types of plan gifts. We have the bequest, which is most common where you include a clause in your trust and your will to leave something to Torrance Memorial. Then two, three, and four are 
are types of things that generate income for you while you're still with us. So you set it up now, you receive income until the end of your life, and then the rest of, of whatever is in that account will come to Torrance Memorial. Uh, retained life estate is the opportunity for you to, to give your house to the hospital. Now, retain the right to live in it, to support it, and uh, you know you continue to pay the taxes and all the utilities, and then after you're gone, Torrance Memorial will take care of um, the, sale, the sale of that and get the benefits. And then an IRA beneficiary is a great way to avoid taxes for your heirs. When you leave your, your IRAs to, your, uh, to people, they have to pay taxes on the income they take from that. If you leave it to the hospital, we're a nonprofit, and so we don't have to uh, pay any of those taxes. So it's a, another good tool. And then I also wanted to mention the IRA qualified charitable distribution. How many of you are taking RMDs, your required minimum distribution from your IRAs? Okay, so I few, see a few hands. You may or may not know that you can use up to $105,000 of your IRA to give to charity. And it, um, it comes directly to us, and then it doesn't get added to your adjusted gross income on your tax return. So it saves you taxes and the calculations that use that AGI. And uh, it's, it's really a great um, opportunity to support charity and help your, your, your tax return too. Um, it qualifies as your RMD. You have to be 70 and a half years old to uh, be eligible to do this. And, um, and the SECURE Act 2.0 was passed a couple of years ago and it also created the op opportunity to use $50,000 of that um, in, of an IRA to create a charitable gift annuity. And that's one of those tools that generates income for you. So there are lots of opportunities with that. If you have questions, you can always call me. And we consider the IRA part of your estate plan. So if you do this um, IRA QCD, we will include you in our Heritage Society. And that is the group of people who have um, in, included Torrance Memorial in one way or another in their estate plan. And uh, so we like to, to recognize you while you're with us. We do an appreciation lunch every year um, just to say thank you for that visionary support. And uh, so those are some things for you to contemplate. My contact information is listed here. You're welcome to give me a call with any questions about any of this. We have a great website. It's listed here at the top. There's a lot of good information there about estate planning. And one of the things I like to always suggest you look at is the personal record book that's listed there. There's an estate planning kit you can download and it gives you the record book, gives you a place to document all your accounts, who your beneficiaries are, it, and you can put it all in one place. It's, it's an online fillable type of form or you can print it out and fill it out. So if you, um, you can find that at that website. If you have trouble finding it, just let me know and I can either send it to you directly or, or I'll point you to the right place. Um, I always, you know, we a community. We need the support of the community to continue uh, providing all the services we do. So here's an opportunity for you, just uh, the different ways you can give. Torrance Memorial is a nonprofit hospital and uh, needs the, you know, depends a lot on community support. So that is. Um, those are my introductory uh, comments. Now I want to turn it over to our, the co-chair, one of our co-chairs, Betty Bergman is an attorney who serves in this role, and Karen Pryor is the other uh, co-chair. She's a certified reverse mortgage special, professional with Mutual of Omaha uh, Reverse Mortgage Division, and she's gonna introduce our speakers for today. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I get into the disclaimer, I just wanted to also acknowledge that this is the end of uh, National Nurses Week. And as the mother of a nurse here at Torrance Memorial, if you know a nurse, say thank you because they do a lot for this hospital. Um, this material is for general information only. It's not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. Um, I would like to introduce the two members of our professional advisory council that came to help this morning. Jean and Brandon, if you'll just wave from the back there. Jean Brown is a fiduciary. He's a licensed professional fiduciary and daily money manager with Bedrock Fiduciaries here in Torrance. And Brandon Holm, Brandon, wave your hand, 
is a CPA with Medical Accounting Services in Redondo Beach. So today's workshop is on savvy social security planning. We have two speakers here today who are just awesome and they are gonna be sharing their knowledge with you. Our first one, Kristen Rigg. She is a certified financial planner and certified divorce financial analyst with EP Wealth Advisors LLC in Torrance. Kristen and her firm offer wealth management services to individuals and families throughout the country. Kristen specializes in, servicing, in serving women in transition, women facing retirement, divorce, and widowhood. An advisor with the heart of a teacher, Kristen explains every detail to her clients until they get it and can then make informed decisions. And her greatest accomplishment being the proud mother of her 13-year-old son, Ashley. We also have Larry Takahashi, CFP, AIF. Larry is an independent financial advisor with Larry Takahashi Financial Services in Torrance. Larry is a certified financial planner, professional, and accredited investment fiduciary and a retirement income certified professional. Larry's primary focus is to help clients build strategies for a successful retirement, including creating an effective retirement income plan and identifying ways to minimize the impact of taxes during their retirement and on their estate. Larry also teaches retirement planning courses at Torrance Adult School. So here they are, Kristen and Larry. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone today? Is, are you excited to talk about Social Security Let me on this Saturday morning? I hope so. <laughs> we'll try to keep it interesting and to the point for you. Um, but again, thank you for joining us today. And I guess I'll start by just putting a question out there because um, you're all here. I mean, you must know how important Social Security is, um, but it, I guess, do you know that it's actually one of the most important decisions you can make for your retirement? The problem is that there are over 2,700 rules governing this program. So it becomes very complicated and very easy to make even the smallest mistakes when you're going to select your benefits. And that's really why we're here today, to help you with that. So before we get started, um, I wanna just point out a few things you really should know about Social Security. The first is that there are many different claiming options. There's really no one size fits all strategy. Everyone's strategy will be unique based on your health, your age, your family, and so forth. The second point to know is that any decision that you make regarding Social Security will have far reaching consequences. An example of that is if you're a married couple and, the, and let's say the man or the first spouse selects to start his benefit early and then he passes away early, the surviving spouse's survivor's benefit could be permanently reduced and impact the rest of her life which we'll talk about in a little bit. So the point is that as a married couple, your choice impacts your spouse's benefit directly. And then it's also important to know, number four here, is that this system is not bankrupt. It's not a Ponzi scheme. It's not what you're hearing all the time in the media. It actually is solvent right now. And Larry's gonna go on and talk about this in more detail in just a minute. Um, and then lastly, I'll just point out, and I don't mean this in a bad way at all, but your friends are not experts. Oftentimes I hear from people that they've selected to take their benefit early perhaps because their friend or their neighbor gave them some great advice. And I don't mean anything bad about that, but it's really important to seek counsel from a professional, someone that can look at your benefit statement, dive in, Look at, look at and crunch the numbers and then let you know what the best strategy is for you. So with those in mind, Larry and I put together this presentation. We're just gonna cover five topics. I'm gonna briefly cover um, understanding the value of social security. And then Larry will talk about the solvency issue. Will social security be there for you? Um, and then I'll talk about how much you can expect to receive Larry will talk about when you should apply, and then we'll end today with some strategies for potentially maximizing your benefits. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. There's just a few slides in this first section, but we really want you to understand the true value of Social Security. It's a big part of your retirement plan, so it has to be taken seriously. 
So the first slide here says Social Security offers income you cannot outlive. So in this example, what we're looking at here, um, and I'm just going to go from top to bottom. Let's say you start taking benefits today and your monthly benefit is $2,000 a month. So we apply what's called a cost of living adjustment, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But essentially, if you start today at $2,000 a month, that means in 10 years, you will have collected $270,000 over that 10 year span. Now, people, as you know, are generally living much longer today than they did, you know, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So if you start 2000 today and you live another 20 years, which happens frequently, then you will have collected six, over 600,000 in lifetime benefits. And likewise, if you live 30 years after you start, you will have collected over a million dollars. So the, this is why there's a big value here and it's important to maximize your benefit to get the, essentially the biggest bang for your buck. Um, and then lastly for this section, and this is really important, that Social Security offers annual inflation adjustments. A lot of times, or most times today, when we look at pension plans from various organizations, a lot of those today, if there is one at all, will not even increase the benefit each year to keep up with inflation. But Social Security does. And throughout this presentation, you'll see that we're using an average annual cost of living adjustment of 2.6% because that's the historical average over a long time period. Recently, the cost of living adjustment has been higher, um, but over a long time period, it's averaged out to about 2.6. So in looking at just the benefit amount, again, going back to today, if you have a $2,000 benefit and we apply that annual increase of 2.6%, that means in 10 years, you won't be collecting 2,000, your benefit will be 2,585. And in 20 years, it'll be valued at 300, 342, and in 30 years, over 4,000. So what this means is that your Social Security benefit is keeping pace with inflation. It's keeping its purchasing power. So it's a very important benefit. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Larry. We're going to tag team here, and Larry is going to talk about, will Social Security be there for you? Okay, Larry. Thank you, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, I'd like to start off with a couple questions to just to get a feel for you know the audience out there. So, how many people are actually you know have filed for Social Security and are receiving benefits currently? Okay. How many people are yet to file for Social Security, and that's something they're going to have to decide. Okay. So this is great because a lot of the points that we're going to be talking about, you know, have to do with, you know, factoring into your decision as to whether you should file, when should you file, etc. So that's great. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solvency of the Social Security program and um, kind of just sort of lay out some, some statistics for you. So this first slide is talking about the Old Age Survivor and Disability Insurance Trust Fund. Um, so Social Security is uh, comprised of two components. One is all of the ongoing income that Social Security receives in the form of payroll taxes. And then the other component is the trust fund. So I like to use an analogy of, you know, you know anybody who, let's say, is working, they're collecting a paycheck. And um, in addition to the paycheck, they may have a savings account. Okay, so um, this individual is going to be spending money over time, right? So a lot of times their paycheck will cover their expenses, right? Some, some periods or some years where maybe their expenses are low and they have extra money, they'll put it in the savings account, okay? In other years when maybe their expenses are high and the paycheck doesn't cover everything, they'll take some money out of the savings account, right? So same thing with Social Security. So over the years, this trust fund has been built up by excess of payroll taxes collected, right? And that excess has been building up the trust fund. Now, baby boomers, right, which is one of the largest aging, you know, cohorts, um, you know, in, in the country, 
they've been in their peak earning years for a number of years. And so because of that, that trust fund has been building up over time. But as the aging baby boomers are starting to retire, we're finding out that, okay, there's not as much payroll taxes coming in now. So as a result, there's some drawdown of the trust fund. So this first slide is talking about how the trust fund uh, drawdown is starting to begin. So if you look at the, the statistics here in 2022, the fund balance was 2.83 trillion. And at the end of 2023, it was 2.78 trillion. So it has started to um, decline. And as a result, just because the payroll tax is collected haven't been sufficient to cover the benefits that have become payable and that are being paid out to people that are filing for benefits. So this next slide is kind of taking a long-term view of uh, benefits that are becoming due and also the funds that are available to pay them. Now, you know, we've been offering this class off and on over the last seven to 10 years through the uh, Torrance Memorial uh, PAC presentations. And this chart has remained fairly constant, right? So it's, it hasn't really changed very much from the last time that we've uh, presented a couple years ago. So you could see that um, uh, right now, as far as projections go, benefits that are payable, there's enough money uh, to cover 100% of those benefits up until 2033. And you could see that right here, 2033. And in 2034, right, the amount of uh, benefits that are uh, that can be covered is gonna drop down to 80%, right? Based upon the amount of income that's coming in. So uh, in 2097, right, only 74% of the benefits are gonna be uh, covered that uh, benefits are entitled to receive. So if you look at that, you could say, well, okay, something is gonna to have to give, right? Because, you know, unless uh, someone's willing to accept only 74% of benefits that they're, they're entitled to, that's gonna be a problem. So, and then this has been going on for a while, right? There's, there's a lot of talk about how do we fix social security? How do we reform the program? And so there's been a lot of talk, a lot of proposals. I'm gonna go over some of the potential solutions that have been discussed. None of these have been decided upon. It's still being discussed in Congress. Um, so the first one is to increase the maximum earnings subject to social security tax, right? So this potentially could be a pretty impactful change uh, should they decide to uh, implement this. So the way that social security payroll taxes are determined is there's a, a maximum earnings amount. And so for 2024, the maximum earnings is 168,600. So yeah, if somebody is making up to 168,600, all of those earnings are gonna be subject to uh, payroll tax, which is really to, for social security. So in 2024, uh, the payroll tax remains at 12.4%. So it was an increase. Uh, the employee pays 6.2%. You see that deducted from your paycheck and then the employer pays the other half, the other 6.2%. So those, taxes that are, are withheld go toward funding social security benefits. So you could see if somebody makes more than 168,600 in 2024, some of their income isn't gonna be subject to social security tax. So just for example, if somebody makes uh, $400,000 a year, they're only gonna pay social security taxes on the first 168,600 the remaining amount is not gonna be taxed for social security. So if you think about it, you know, people that make substantially more than 168,000, there's a lot of earnings potentially that could be taxed for social security purposes, right? So obviously that would increase the amount of taxes coming in to help fund social security. Uh, reform proposal number two would be to increase the full retirement age. So as we all know, you know, 
people's life expectancy uh, over time has been increasing. Um, although I think during the pandemic, there was like a little blip, but generally speaking, we're all living longer, right? Uh, medical advances, all of that. So people are, are living longer, um, whether or not they work longer, right, uh, is another question. But one proposal would be to increase the full retirement age when somebody is entitled to 100% of their Social Security benefits. So if you look at the table here, you could see based upon when someone was born, their full retirement age will be somewhere between age 66 and 67. So one proposal would be, well, if you increase the full retirement age, right, that would give the program more time to accumulate and uh, payments would begin at a later date potentially. So that's another proposal that's being discussed. Proposal number three would be to reduce the cost of living adjustment, right? Kristen talked about how Social Security um, comes with a COLA adjustment or a cost of living adjustment. You could see on this table what the actual cost of living adjustments have been from 1983 up until um, this most recent year where they announced the, the cost of living was gonna be 3.2%. So obviously by reducing that cost of living adjustment, that would um, uh, reduce the burden of benefits that would ultimately be payable. And then proposal number four would be to reduce the benefits for future retirees, right? So uh, depending on how benefits are calculated and as far as uh, this talks about escalating benefits for future retirees based on a cost of a consumer price index instead of wage growth, uh, presumably that would slow the, the growth of benefits. So there's a lot of things that are being bandied about um, now, again, nothing has been finalized. Uh, if somebody is interested in looking at all the different proposals that are being talked about, uh, I could direct you to a uh, website. This is really uh, the website for the American, uh, Actu uh, American Academy of Actuaries. So they're the ones that really kind of study this. Uh, their website is actuary.org, so if you're really into looking at what uh, people are contemplating and talking about, I would uh, direct you over there. Um, there's another piece of legislation that has been kind of, you know, in Congress for the last number of years. It's called uh, the Social Security 2100 Act, uh, Sacred Trust. Uh, the Congressman John Larson, who is from Connecticut, is the one who is sponsoring it. Um, actually, this uh, proposal would uh, result with in full solvency through the next 75 year uh, projection period. So um, now that hasn't really made it all the way through to where they would actually be voting on it. Uh, potentially it could be uh, looked at this year, but you know, there's a lot of things going on. So maybe not so much. A couple of points. One of the interesting things about it is, and again, there's a lot of different components to it. I'll just mention a couple of interesting ones. One is, um, uh, as far as how the Social Security benefits are calculated, uh, this would increase uh, what's called the first bend point from 0.90 to 0.93. Now that's a little bit into the weeds. It has to do with how the Social Security benefit is calculated. Um, I don't think we're actually gonna get into the actual nuts and bolts, but the point is, it's going to adjust the calculation to increase the benefit. Um, the other big uh, component to that is what we talked about earlier before is raising the uh, taxable earnings uh, amount from 168,000 to a higher level. So this proposal talks about uh, taxing uh, people with income greater than $400,000, right? Above 400,000, they would apply another Social Security tax to that to obviously that's going to raise uh, quite a bit of money for the for the trust fund so. Um, there's a lot of things sort of in the works, uh, I think the, the bottom line is. Um, something will need to be done. Um, right now and again as Kristen mentioned 
the program is not bankrupt, right? So if I if I go back to the analogy of uh, you know earning a paycheck, having a savings account, right? So the the first slide that I put up where the trust fund has started to decline is really you know in that that example where somebody is saying, okay, well my expenses have gone up or my paycheck doesn't cover it, so I'm going to have to start drawing down from my savings account. So that's really sort of where we're at. We can project to see where it's going. Um, but I think the bottom line is, is that, you know, do we expect something to be done, something to be done with Congress, um, or as opposed to just letting it continue on? So, you know, my view is that something will be done eventually. Um, this slide talks about saying that for baby boomers, right? So again, baby boomers um, defined typically as people born between 1946 and 1964. So that means uh, baby boomers are going to be currently between ages 60 and 78. Um, obviously, very close to retirement or in retirement, right? Um, my thought, those baby boomers are not really going to be impacted um, because of the reform. And a lot of these changes that we talked about may impact the younger generation more so. So um, I know and Kristen alluded to it earlier, is that when people hear things like, oh, Social Security is going bankrupt, so therefore I need to you know, make a filing decision, like filing as soon as I can, I'd really encourage against not making that decision based upon sort of your assessment of the state of the Social Security program. Um, there's a lot of other factors that you should think about on when you should should you file, et cetera, that we'll talk about in a little bit. But I think as far as the, the stability of the program, basing that on a decision to file, I, I'd say I would uh, recommend you don't do that. So, um, OK, so let's um, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Kristen, and she's going to talk about um, how much you can expect to receive from Social Security. Okay, I have a really quick um, thing I wanted to share because Larry mentioned the baby boomer group. If you ever want to remember what those actual years are, the 1946 to 1964, just switch the six and the four. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I remember. Thought I'd share that. Um, okay, so I hope. La I mean, I think Larry did. You did a great job on addressing the solvency issue, and we'll take questions on that after, if there are any. Um, now we're going to talk about how much you ex can expect to receive. Um, one important action item to take away today, if you haven't done this already, is to go to the Social Security website. It's ssa.gov. The homepage looks a little bit different than what I'm showing you here um, because they recently joined the Social Security site with Medicare. So you can kind of get everything for both of those at this site. But the point for today is to go here and click on my social security, which is the one on the very left hand side, or you'll find that on the home page and sign up for an account if you don't have one already. Once you sign up for an account, you can um, download a current copy of your uh, PDF copy of your social security statement, and then you can obtain copies of those each year online. And you can also apply for benefits at using this site and you can do medicare it's they've made the site a lot easier to use initially when they set this up um, about a decade ago the security questions were daunting things like tell me the last six digits of your american express credit card from 19 something i mean it, it was ridiculous so it was very difficult for people to use it is a very secure site so they will ask some potentially obscure questions, but it's worth it to go on and use. It's pretty user-friendly once you get signed on. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk now about how much you can expect to receive from Social Security. So to put it simply, your benefit amount depends on two things. The first one is it depends on how much you've earned over your entire working career. And the second thing is the age in which you apply for benefits. So I'm gonna talk about the first one how much you've earned over your working career and kind of break down as easy as I can how your benefit is calculated and looked at. 
So first thing is when you have your statement, you may, some of you may have seen this, but all of these numbers here, this is a sample of an earnings record. So at your age 62, what the administration does is they look at e your annual earnings, each year's earnings. So by the way, your earnings that are listed on your social security statement come directly from your tax return. So those are rep so the IRS reports to Social Security each year, and that's how your gross earnings show up on your Social Security statement. Um, so at 62, all of your earnings are tallied up and indexed for inflation. And they look at your highest 35 years of earnings. So if you've worked 50 years, you're going to see your highest 35. Or if you haven't worked 35 years, the you'll see zero years like in this example down at the bottom and zero years count so the more zero years you have the lower your benefits going to be and the longer you've worked or the more years you have the higher your benefits going to be so one example of how a benefit can be lower um, we don't see this as much anymore but we did a lot re um, over the last maybe 10 years is you might have a female working, for example, and then she will step out of the workforce to raise children. So there will be a pocket of zero years, maybe 10 years in there, and then we'll go back to work. And then by the time she retires, finds that her benefit is not perhaps like the size of her spouse's. And that's because of those zero years. So zero years count, that's kind of the point of me saying this because there are opportunities to fill in those zero years if you plan to continue working. Once they have your highest 35 years of earnings and they've indexed them for inflation, then they apply their very complicated formula, which has all these bend, bend points, which we're, we're really not going to get into today, but it's designed to provide more income to the lower earning individual. But once they've been calculated and that they've applied their formula, they get to what's called your primary insurance amount. So you may see this term on your statement, and they just call it PIA, P-I-A, primary insurance amount. And that's the amount that you would receive at your full retirement age. So I know that's a lot of information, but the important thing to know is highest 35 years of earnings and primary insurance amount is your full Social Security benefit without reductions and without um, increases. So once you have that number, so let's say your full retirement age is 67, that's your primary insurance amount is the benefit you would get at 67, your full retirement age. So then once you have that amount, let's say you're 62 years old, um, then it's up to you how much you're going to receive. And that's going to depend on if you apply for benefits early, if you apply for benefits at your full retirement age, or if you apply for benefits later. So you've got your primary insurance amount, which is what you would receive at full retirement age. And let me just um, say this too, for um, full retirement age of 66 is anyone born between 1943 and 1954. And age 67 is anyone born between, or ac actually anyone born after 1960. And then there's this little group in between, if you're born between 1955 and 1959, your full retirement age is 66 and a few months. So that's kind of the range there, but we just use two examples here. Um, so your benefits going to depend on when you apply between age 62 and 70. That's your, that's, those are your choices. You can start early at 62 or you can wait all the way to 70. If you start early at 62, um, let's just look at the um, age, the full retirement age of 67, the middle column. So if you start your benefit early at 62, um, you're not going to get 100% of your benefit. You're only going to get 70%. And that choice is permanent, except in one case, which I'll come back and explain. But it's essentially it's permanent, um, and you're going to have that reduced benefit for your lifetime. And then as you get older with each year, the amount you receive goes up. So if you decide to start early at 65, let me try to use my pointer here. Oh, I did it, okay. At 65 and your full retirement age is 67, you're only gonna get 86.7% of your benefit. So you only get 100% of your benefit when you start at full retirement age. 
And really important to know here is that anytime you start before your full retirement age, it's like the bells go off on your account because your benefit is permanently reduced and then it has the potential of reducing your spouse's benefit later on. And I'll show you an example of that. So at the very least, unless there is a specific reason, which again, I'll show you, at the very least, it's important to at least wait until you reach full retirement age. Now that's not possible all the time, perhaps for health reasons, or maybe there's a spousal strategy that suggests one of the spouses starts earlier. Um, but for the most part, um, it's important to at least wait until then. Now, if you wait until after full retirement age, this is where the real value comes in. Um, so again, let's look at the last column. If your full retirement age, oh, sorry. I knew I was gonna screw that up. If your full retirement age is 67. So if you apply, if you, so first of all, for every year you wait after your full retirement age to age 70, you earn an additional 8% in annual delayed retirement credits. So you really have to think of it like this. If your full retirement age is 67 and you wait until 68 to collect your benefit, you're gonna automatically get an 8% increase plus the cost of living adjustment, which again, we're assuming is about 2.6. So in reality, if you wait, you're gonna get about a 10.6% increase just in waiting one year. That's a big deal. No, no advisor can guarantee a 10% return in the stock market in any given year, but this is guaranteed. So it's really important to remember that. Um, now, the longest you can wait is until age 70. And so when you add up those 8% delayed retirement credits, by the time you're age 70, you're now getting 124% of your benefit plus the cost of living adjustment. So this is a big deal. It makes a big difference. It, it also, um, you know, you, the, if you collect your largest maximum benefit, today I think that's gonna be, if you're age 70 and you've, earned, and you've earned the most, I, I think that's around 4,700-ish a month. By the time you're in your 80s and 90s, that benefit will have almost doubled because of cost of living adjustments. It's a very valuable benefit, but not everyone can wait, and we do understand that, which is why it's so important to get advice on what your strategy should be. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about your social security statements, um, which are changing, they have changed a little bit. This is an um, example from a few years ago, but I just wanted to point this out. On, on your statements, it will say things like, um, here's what you would get at full retirement age, but here's what you would get at age 62, and here's what you'd get at age 70. Some of you might be very familiar with that. The point of this slide is to remind you that those numbers that they're reporting on the statement are in today's dollars. They are not in future dollars. So. Let's say in this case, well, I use this example, Lisa is age 57 and she's got 10 years until her full retirement age of 67. So currently her social security statement reads that um, she would get, these numbers are small, $2,330 a month at her full retirement age. Um, that, those numbers there are in today's dollars. So what she would actually get is gonna be much higher because they have not applied those cost of living adjustments yet. So that's really why we put this slide up here, just so you know that we're not talking about future dollars, we're talking about today's dollars, which makes a difference. Um, okay, so we talked about the benefit formula and we talked about um, generally how much you can expect to receive, but there's other ways to receive benefits. And that's if you're a spouse, and if you're a, survi a surviving spouse. So I'm gonna talk about spousal benefits and then I'm gonna talk about survivor benefits. And the easiest way to kind of, I guess, wrap your brain around this is that when I'm talking about spousal benefits, I'm talking about a married couple, both, of, both individuals are living, okay? And that, in that case, the lower earning spouse is entitled to half of the higher earning spouse's benefit. You get a choice. You either, when you apply for Social Security, you either collect your own benefit or your spousal benefit. If you collect your spousal benefit, that's half of your spouse's. 
So just remember half for spousal benefits. When we talk about survivor's benefits, it's all. So I'll come back to that. So let me kind of explain how this works. So in this example, we have John and Jane who are married. Both have reached their full retirement age. In this case, it was 66. So John's benefit is $2,000 a month and Jane's individual benefit is 800. So Jane can apply, and today actually, when you apply, they will give you the higher of the two. You either pick your individual benefit or your spousal benefit, um, but, but if you apply for your, your individual benefit today and your spouse is already on record with their benefit, they will give you the spousal benefit. But it's just important to know that in this case, Jane's benefit is less than half of her husband's benefit. So half is 1,000 and her benefit is only 800. So Jane would use the spousal option and apply for her spousal benefit and get more, essentially. The spousal benefit option was really, it was designed in 1935 to help the um, stay-at-home parents, really. I hope that makes sense. So it's just half, you get, you're entitled to half of your spouse's benefit. Um, and then there's some rules that make it a little more complicated, but in order to collect a spousal benefit, your spouse has to be collecting their own benefit. So if you have a married couple, and let's go back to here really quick. Um, if you have this married couple, if John hasn't started his benefit, then Jane cannot go in and apply for her spousal benefit. Okay, she has to wait until John applies for his. Um, and then just like with an individual benefit, a spouse can start early, but if, if he or she does, they will receive a reduced benefit. So instead of 50%, they're gonna get less. So for example, if a spouse starts a spousal benefit at age 64, oh my gosh, sorry, um, they are gonna get just 37.5% of their benefit. And then last, so that's really important to know. So a lot of times I'll see spouses go in and apply at 62 and, and you just lost 20% of your spousal benefit. So you wanna really think about that. And then lastly, those delayed retirement credits that I mentioned do not apply to spousal benefits. So the most a spouse can get is just 50% of her spouse's primary insurance amount, which is the full retirement age benefit. It's a lot of information, right? <laughs> so that's why we wanna take questions at the end. And that's why, you know, there's so many different rules. We're really trying to just point out the, the high, the um, kind of the high points really. Okay, and then rather than reading this slide, I'm just gonna tell you a quick story about divorce spouse benefits. Essentially, if you are, if you have, if you're divorced and you're not remarried, and but you were married for ten years, you're entitled to half of your ex-spouse's social security benefit. It's you know that simple. You have to have been married ten years, um, and you cannot be remarried. And the biggest question I get on this is, well, I um, things like I don't want to apply because I don't want my ex-spouse to think I'm taking money. That's one of them. Or I don't know how to get the information. But the way it actually works, and this is a true story, we had a gentleman we worked with a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago. He was married and divorced three times, and each of those marriages lasted more than 10 years. Yes, more than 10 years. And his, each of those ex-spouses never remarried. So all three of those ex-spouses were entitled to a divorce spouse benefit, which is half of his, and they each received it, they still are, and his benefit was not impacted, nor was he notified. That's literally how it works. It's really interesting why we have problems with Social Security, but that's, you know, the, there's kind of those loopholes that come in um, because people can collect a lot of money off of one person if they've been divorced multiple times. So that's kind of the way I summarize this slide to keep it simple. There is a divorce spouse benefit available if that applies. And then lastly, for this section, I mentioned earlier, survivor benefits. So this is, again, for a married couple, and I'll just start with the example. Um, in this case, Jack is, so Jack and Jill are married. Jack's receiving 2,000 a month, and Jill is receiving her own benefit of 1,200 a month. When Jack passes away and she notifies the Social Security Administration, her, she gets to keep either her benefit or the survivor's benefit, whichever is greater. 
in this case, it's the survivor's benefit. So she would retain the $2,000. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, and then I have this, these rules for survivor's benefits. Uh, one second here. Essentially, just to remember, um, the big one is that in order for somebody, someone to be eligible for a survivor's benefit, they must have been married at least nine months. So you can't just get married for a month and then somebody passes away and you collect benefits. You have to at least be married for nine months. Um, there's also um, divorced spouse survivor's benefits. And then the actual survivor's benefit is typically it's 100% of what your spouse was collecting. So again, we go back to Jack and Jill. When Jack passes away, Jill keeps the higher of the two. But, and here's a really fun chart, which I tried to simplify, but it's almost impossible to simplify this. So I just wanna give you one example. Um, your actual survivor's benefit for a surviving spouse is gonna depend on two factors. So if we go back to Jack and Jill, um, if, so this, this shows you an example of Jill collecting her survivor's benefit early at 62 versus later at 70. If her husband, Jack, had applied early, um, I'm sorry, if, her, if she claimed her benefit at age 62 early, you can see here, depending on what age she claimed early um, over here, that you're only gonna get a percentage of the survivor's benefit. But if Jack had waited to collect his, that $2,000 benefit, if he had waited until age 70 to get the, his highest benefit, for example, then over here, when Jill goes to collect her benefit, she's gonna collect a lot more. So this, this is, the bottom line is it comes down to your decisions impacting your spouse. If you start early, um, your survivor, in this case, gets $1,716-ish in this range. If you delay your benefit and start later, your surviving spouse is going to get a lot more. And this income makes a big difference in the future. Um, okay, so I know that was a lot of information, but I think the most important takeaway here is just to remember that your benefit depends on your earnings record and that whether you your actual benefit depends on when you apply and if you apply earlier your de your benefit is reduced if you apply later it increases okay so i'm going to turn it over to larry to talk about those increases and when you should actually apply and what you should base those factors on Okay, so when should you apply for Social Security? Now, to me, this is a critical decision that everyone's going to make as part of, you know, planning for retirement. Um, so there's a number of factors that you want to think about, you want to consider before you, you know, make that decision. Um, we can see here, uh, the first one is health status right? Um, someone may have some health or medical issues that may ultimately impact their life expectancy, which is the second uh, point um, listed here. Another key factor is the need for income, right? So uh, Social Security is uh, one type of uh, retirement income. There is uh, obviously can be other income sources, uh, for people's situations, whether or not you plan to continue working, right? So traditionally, when people retired, they may have worked a long time at a, at a certain company, they retired, um, maybe they started collecting a pension, uh, but they didn't go back to work. Um, uh, today, a lot of people, when they retire from, let's say, their primary career, they continue working, maybe on a part-time basis, um, maybe they change careers and they, they start working some more in, in retirement, right? They actually have a name for that, it's called a hybrid retirement, and a lot of it has to do with just the overall preparedness of the nation in general for retirement. I think, unfortunately, um, as a whole, 
most people in in you know, United States are not adequately prepared, and so as a result, working part time may be a requirement for their for their retirement. Um, and then survivor needs as well. So, um, one thing I just want to sort of talk sort of high level is as far as uh, when should you decide to apply? The thing that I want to emphasize and encourage everyone to do is to make that decision on when to apply for Social Security in conjunction with uh, an overall retirement plan. Okay, so uh, a lot of times people may look at the Social Security filing decision sort of in a vacuum. They'll say, okay, you know, here's my amount that I can get. Do I, should I take it? Should I not take it? Right. So uh, again, Social Security is one source of retirement income, right? So uh, for somebody planning for retirement, right, and you're looking at, well, okay, what's my retirement going to look like? What do, I, what do I want to do in retirement? How much is it going to cost? Do I have the income to support that? Well, you know, besides Social Security, there could be a company pension, right? There could be distributions from somebody's retirement accounts, right? Over time, they may have hopefully built up their 401k, maybe they have IRAs, et cetera. Uh, maybe they have some other uh, sources of retirement income. Maybe they own some rental properties, that type of thing. So uh, when you make that decision, you wanna make sure and put it in the context of, well, you know, what else am I going to have for, for income, right? Am I going to be working, in which case maybe I'll have some supplemental income and maybe I can't afford to wait to delay my uh, Social Security benefit. Um, now, obviously, the first two, health status, life expectancy, those are all uh, critical as well because, you know, Social Security and all of the benefits that come along with it are actuarially determined as well, right? So whether you file early and take it at 62 at a lower amount, or if you delay taking Social Security and get a higher amount, right? All of those amounts that you're entitled to are based on actuarial determination of people's life expectancy, et cetera. So um, that's all going to come into play uh, when you make that decision on when you want to file. So. So this next slide talks about um, the fact that by delaying benefits, you're gonna get a bigger starting check from Social Security. Um, so Kristen kind of went through some of the, the, the numbers and sort of the, the trade-offs on it. This one sort of uh, re-summarized that. So in this example, assuming somebody, uh, their full retirement age is age 67, right, their full retirement benefit or PIA is $2,800 and we'll assume a 2.6% COLA amount. So you could see, right, the choices between filing at the earliest age 62 or waiting till the latest possible age, age 70, there's a pretty big spread in the amount of what your starting check is gonna be. So in this example, Right, if somebody filed at the earliest possible age 62, right? And again, we're assuming a PIA of $2,800. So at age 62, there's a 30% reduction in benefit in order for somebody to file early, right? So you could see the benefit without a cost of living adjustment is 1,960, okay? Um, you could, if you skip down to age 67, right, again, that's the full retirement age where you would get 100% of your benefit, right? Uh, that benefit, there's the $2,800. And then again, by delaying taking your benefit each additional age up through age 70, you're going to pick up another 8% 8, 8 per year uh, plus cost of living. So. Uh, if I go to the very bottom at age 70, somebody who waited until age 70 to file, right, they're going to be getting 124% of their uh, PIA. Um, that's going to be 3,472. And with cost of living, because you do benefit from the cost of living each year that you delay, $4,263. So if you just kind of compare, 
1,960 with 4,263, that's more than double, right? Now, obviously the trade-off is if you file early, you're gonna be picking up smaller paychecks, but you'll be getting those at 863, 64, right? While somebody else who's waiting is not getting anything, right? They're delaying their benefit. So there's a trade-off. Um, and but again, what comes into play are these assumptions on how long does somebody think they're going to live, all of that. You know, can they afford to delay to pick up that benefit, right? So, you know, obviously, if somebody is in a position where they absolutely need the Social Security money in order to survive, well, you know, there's not going to be a lot of analysis, I guess. But, you know, for people that potentially have options to delay or not delay, right? I think it's important to kind of uh, analyze all of these factors. So in addition to getting uh, a bigger starting paycheck by delaying, if somebody does delay benefits, uh, it's gonna provide more income later on, right? So again, if we use the same uh, assumption full retirement age 67, $2,800 uh, prime insurance amount and a 2.6% 2, 2 COLA. Again, so here, if somebody did in fact delay, right, to age 70, right, versus somebody who filed early at age 62, you could see the differentials, right? So again, this is that original, whoop. I did it. Here's that one we talked about, right? The big spread between filing early or waiting to age 70. And you could see the impact over time for each of those decisions, right? So again, the person claiming early, you know, when they're age 85, their benefit will be 3537 versus 6266 if they had waited, right? And on and on. So, you know, there's big implications on when you decide to file for benefits. Now, interestingly, you know, based on statistics, most people file at age 62. That's statistically. Um, I would say in many of those cases, they probably left money on the table, right? Um, again, we don't know how many filed because they had to, they needed the money versus somebody who filed early, maybe they thought Social Security was going bankrupt, so they wanted to try to get whatever they could. Um, but basically, right, I would say in most of the cases that I've looked at, filing at 62 would not be the optimal decision, right? Because based on other parameters, which I think we're gonna take a look at that later, is um, you probably would not want to file. So, uh, so again, to me, this is a great slide because it really offers this comparison, right? In terms of what potentially, what the difference is potentially by waiting versus filing early. Now, sometimes it, someone might say, well, gee, if I'm gonna retire, I need money, right? So how do I even delay social security? I may not be able to do it. Well. Sometimes, and again, I, I hear it quite a bit is um, someone may say, well, you know, I need to file early because I don't have any money. And they say, well, you've got retirement accounts that potentially you could draw down on, right? And that might enable you to delay your social security benefit. A lot of times people say, well, oh, I, I thought I wasn't supposed to take money out of my retirement accounts until I had to, like in, when I hit, you know, retirement minimum distribution age. Well, th that's actually not correct, right? You can take money out of your retirement accounts once you're over 59 and a half if you want to, right? So that could very well be a good strategy to enable somebody to delay taking their benefit, let's say at age 70, right? By drawing down from their retirement accounts to fund their retirement while they delay, right? So Kristen had mentioned that, you know, no advisor can guarantee a 10% return on their money, right? So if you have 
funds sitting in an IRA account, right? You know, can you guarantee that you could get the equivalent of 10% uh, return? And by that, 8%, right? We talked about 8% delayed credit plus cost of living. You really would not be able to do that, right? So I'd say you'd be hard pressed to find any other alternative investment that could generate a guaranteed 8% plus cost of living lifetime income stream, right? That Social Security offers by delaying. So, so yeah, so sometimes it's a matter of just understanding your situation and realizing, okay, maybe this is critical. How can I do it, right? So sometimes it may be, there may be solutions that you may not be aware of. So that's important to really kind of think about that. So again, just to kind of um, summarize some points to remember when you're trying to figure out when should you apply. Um, remember, if you file early before your full retirement age, you're locking in that lower benefit, right? And it stays lower for, for the rest of your life. And there are implications, right? Kristen talked about spousal benefits, or spouse benefits, et cetera, have that implication on when you file. If you file early, how could reduce those as well? So the cost of living is another one, right? So uh, Social Security you know, provides cost of living adjustments. So uh, those COLAs are gonna magnify the impact on filing early and waiting, right? Either it's gonna magnify sort of the reduction or it can also magnify the potential additional income that you can receive. So, um, and again, and this was really important, I'm glad that Kristen talked about it, is impacting survivor benefits as well. And one thing that comes up, and I, I've heard it before, is if somebody is in poor health, Right, and they say, "Well, okay, I'm in poor health. I don't think I'm going to live that long, so you know, I'm I'm age 62, and you know, I'm going to file early." Okay, that that could be the best decision, but it may not be right because, again, when we we talked about survivors' benefits, even if somebody was in poor health, let's say, and they passed away at age 71, okay. So if they filed early, passed away at 71, their spouse would receive a reduced survivor's benefit. But it had that person delayed until age 70 and then passed away, right? Their spouse would have received a much higher survivor benefit. And if that spouse lived another 20 years, you know, that, that could be huge. So, you know, I'd mentioned that it's important to make this decision in conjunction with an overall retirement plan um, the other thing that I want to point out is that there are um, tools available to help you analyze uh, the decision, right? So there's a lot of numbers that you've been looking at, could be overwhelming, could be confusing, but there are software calculators out there. I think Kristen's going to show you an example in a little bit of one, but those will help you evaluate all the different choices, um, particularly, you know, married couples have more different decisions and I'd say opportunity on formulating filing strategies as far as if somebody, it might may make sense for somebody to file early and another one, let's say the higher earning spouse to delay, right? So there's a lot of different alternatives. These, these software programs will help you understand, get your arms around those and make, make a more informed decision. Um, I know I'd say most advisors, a lot of advisors may use those. I know Chris and I, I think we both use a similar program to help evaluate that. So if that's the one thing I could you know, Im impress upon you is before you make that decision is to really do that analysis. If it's um, something that's kind of overwhelming you, you know, seek help from a professional for assistance on it because it can have a, a significant impact. I've seen you know, some analysis show differences of over six figures over the course of a couple's lives and potential benefits that they um, may end up uh, receiving. So you don't want to leave any money on the table. So um, with that, I am going to turn it back to Kristen. We're going to talk about how you can maximize your benefits. Okay, 
Okay, we're almost at the end. We are at the end here. Just want to give you a few tips on maximizing or potentially maximizing your benefits. Um, so the first one is you can improve your earnings record. So we talked about earlier, and I touched on this a bit earlier, but again, the Social Security Administration is looking at your 35 highest years of earnings. Any work you do now, if it's higher than any, any um, uh, year that's on your statement, it will replace the lower years. So if you have zero years, you can fill up those years by even working one or two years longer. Or if you have very low income years and you can earn more now, it will replace a low year and it will give you a higher benefit. Um, and that's really important. So everyone generally should look at their um, social security statement and at least go through your earnings record. Sometimes they're, it's very rare to actually find a mistake because it's all done electronically through the, um, through the IRS, but it's still important to look. You know, perhaps one year is missed. If you think it's missed, you can get it corrected on the Social Security site. So the first one is to improve earnings record. Um, this one is, the next one is to understand the annual earnings test. There's a lot of myths about this. But if you are working still and you are collecting Social Security benefits, your benefit may be, um, your benefit may be impacted, but temporarily. So essentially, if you apply for Social Security before your full retirement age and you're working, you're going to have a reduction in benefits. So if they reduce benefits, $1 is reduced or withheld for every $2 you earn over a certain amount. But this should not discourage anyone from working because, so again, it's before your full retirement age and you've started Social Security early. If you're working, they're going to reduce benefits. But what happens is at full retirement age, those benef those reductions that they took, they actually flow back in. So you get them back, which they don't tell anyone that. It just happens. Another one of those crazy rules, but it, that's what happens. So don't let that discourage you from working if, you're, if you are uh, before your full retirement age. And then if you are working and you're after full retirement age and collecting your benefit, there is no reduction. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, Larry talked a lot about this, about applying for Social Security at the right time based on your life circumstances. One thing I wanted to share generally was that there is a general break-even age between if meaning if you start your benefits early at 62 versus at your full retirement age or at 62 versus your age 70 where you can get your maximum benefit. So on all of the analysis that we've done, the general break even age ranges from age 78 to 80. So what that means is that if you think you're gonna live to age 78 to 80 in that range, to that range and or beyond, it is better to wait to collect benefits. That means you will collect more in cumulative lifetime benefits. That's what the break even means. If you think that you're not gonna live to that age range, then it's actually better to start early. So no one can predict what our, life, our own life expectancies are. It sounds kind of ridiculous actually, but if you do have a serious health concern, it is something to consider. There are times when um, we do advise people start early in certain circumstances. Okay, so one of the most important things for a married couple, or, and actually this could apply for certain divorced spouses as well, but mostly for married couples, is to be sure to coordinate your spousal benefits. And again, this is not a one-size-fits-all. I'm just going to give you two examples of what we've seen lately over the last five years of really working with spouses. And this is just a general, these are just two general examples. Um, the first one is where you have, so you have a married couple. Let's just use John and Lisa. Um, and uh, John's benefit is higher than Lisa's. Um, but Lisa's benefit is more than half of John's. It's mind boggling sometimes, but let's put it in numbers. So let's say John's individual benefit is 2000 and Lisa's individual benefit is 1200. So that means that Lisa is entitled to more than half of John's. So half of John's is a thousand, but she can get 1200. That's the kind of circumstance we're looking at. In this case, 
Generally, it's better for both spouses to wait until age 70 to collect benefits. That's going to maximize. And again, these are just um, examples that our team has seen really over the last five years. This is a winning strategy. It's kind of a winning rule of thumb, unless there's a circumstance in there that, you know, where somebody needs to start early. So there's that one. And then the other one is um, we call it a hybrid strategy. And this might, this is really going to sound odd, but this, this, there are instances with spouses where it does make sense for someone to start early. So in this case, let's just stick with John and Lisa. Um, John's got 2000, but Lisa's individual benefit is less than half of John. So less than a thousand, let's just say hers is, her individual benefit is 500 as an example. In this case, it may be beneficial for Lisa to start her individual benefit early at 62 63 64 and take that reduction um, and collect that income while john waits to his age 70 to get his maximum benefit because then what happens is that when he starts at 70 her benefit will automatically go up to be half or approximately half of his benefit because he waited for so long so it's it's just it's one of those things where if you just remember if the lower earning spouses benefit is less than half of the higher earning spouses, it may be better for some for the that spouse to start early. It allows you to collect income while you're trying to maximize the higher earning spouses benefit to get you know to age 70. So even I, I get tongue tied talking about spousal strategies, which is why spousal analysis is is recommended. Um, they do have some great calculators on the Social Security website, but the other thing, and Larry really mentioned this well, is that this is just one part of your retirement plan. So you've got to integrate your Social Security strategy in with your retirement plan. But either way, the spousal analysis is really important. And I'm going to actually come back to this one. I'm going to skip. I just skipped one slide because this was really kind of what Larry was talking about. And I'm gonna just summarize this in one slide because it's really important. Um, our you know, traditional financial planning says, leave your money in your IRAs and your 401ks as long as you can and start social security as soon as you can. And it is not, that's not the case. It's the exact opposite. It really is. It is you, first of all, you want to look at maximizing your social security benefit and then along the way, as Larry said, you want to consider filling up your tax brackets with IRA distributions, either to do Roth conversions or to use those as income. It, that way you're collecting, you're collecting a higher guaranteed social security benefit and you're, you're kind of doing other things. So I, I kind of mapped out an example of the, this really important um, age range of 60 to 70 ish um, so if you if, let's say you retire at 60 so you retire and have no medical insurance as an example we see that a lot now we see people retiring earlier and later but in this case earlier so first you've got to bridge the gap to medicare because health insurance as you know is so expensive so you get to 65 and then you start medicare and then you get to your full retirement age so between 66 and 70 you delay benefits until age 70 to get those annual retirement credits. And then along the way, say from your retire, you know, 63 to 70, you're utilizing portfolio or IRA distributions to cover expenses or to do or to um, take advantage of other tax strategies. That's really important. You don't want to let your IRAs balloon out and then you're having to pay so much tax later in life. That's a big deal. Um, and then at age 70, you start your maximum social security benefits. So that I think that kind of summarizes what Larry says. It's kind of, it's all integrated into one. Really important to look at it that way. Um, and then just a few more points is, um, we've talked about seeking guidance. Um, the Social Security Administration is, um, their website is great and they do have some great people working there. But what they are trained to do is to give you printouts, your, you know, estimate your individual benefits, tell you how much you're entitled to now. They are not trained to project future benefits or do scenario planning or truly advise you on what the best strategy is. And I, frankly, over the last 
few years, I've seen more and more of that. And you just want to be careful that you're not taking advice from, I don't want to say wrong individual, but I'm just trying to explain what they're trained to do. You know, they're, they're very efficient at what they do, actually. Um, but you want to be careful because they're not really trained to do scenario planning. And then, um, now this is something that has come up with us recently as well. I've got two more kind of slides or tips here. What if you are here and you've started your benefit early and you don't really need it and maybe you feel or maybe you feel like you've made a mistake, you haven't reached full retirement age and let's say you started at 62. Well, you can actually stop your benefit. Um, well, let me go back. First of all, when you first apply for Social Security um, the first time, um, if you change your mind in the first 12 months, you can pay back all your benefits that you've received over the 12 months interest free and then you can your benefit will continue to accrue it used to be where you could pay back like if you had started five years ago you could pay back all your benefits interest free and they they took that away so it's one year you have a one year do over period um, but the other thing as i was saying earlier is if you started early you can actually stop your benefit and it will still earn any remaining credits. So let's say you started at 62 and you, you're you only getting 75% of your full retirement age benefit. If you stop the benefit, the benefit still freezes at that level, but it will earn, the lower the reduced benefit can earn delayed retirement credits between age 66 and 70. So that's really important to know if, if you or if you know someone that feels like they started too early and they're not age 70 yet, they can stop their benefit, let it earn credits, and then start it up again later. Um, and then our last slide here, because we always seem to get questions on these, um, this does not apply to everyone, but for some it might. Um, and these are two different provisions that could impact a social security benefit. So one is the government offset provision and one's the windfall elimination provision. Um, and this only applies to government workers or teachers under the CalSTRS program um, and a few others. So if you um, are an employee or a government employee or a teacher of that sort, um, and you are not, you may not be paying into Social Security. You're paying into a whole different system. You're either paying into the state pension system or the teachers pay into the CalSTRS pension. Not all of them, but in many cases. If that's the case, um, then you're, you know, then you're going to get a pension from one of those, di those divisions. And I have seen people go to try to collect a Social Security benefit to come, to walk away with being told they, they're not, they're not going to get anything. And that's because if they're getting a government pension, um, it's going to offset their Social Security benefit by most, um, by at least two thirds, usually. And there's so many different provisions, but the provisions are the government offset provision will offset the spousal and survivor's benefit and the windfall elimination provision offsets the individual benefit. Um, Again, I get most of these questions from um, teachers in our community um, and the way there is no way around it. Um, but the way to have that analyzed is to go to the Social Security Administration and ask for all the data and then have a professional look at it. And then lastly, um, this is also kind of what Larry was saying is that Social Security is too important for guesswork. You want to coordinate Social Security benefits with your overall retirement plan. And that's what we have for you today. I hope it wasn't too much information. I hope you enjoy that and we will take questions now. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our first question is, if there's a missing year in earnings, how long does it take Social Security to update their record once they receive the correct info from the individual? So, um, from what, so I have only dealt with this a few times, but there is a form, first of all, on the Social Security website um, that you can print off. But what you, wanted, what you wanna do, if this is the case, is you want to call the Social Security Administration, the 800 numbers all over the, their website. And um, 
you want to try to make an appointment i I've, I've been hearing that they're not really taking appointments anymore which is a bummer but the best thing to do there is to actually go into their office with your documents whatever documents you have typically it's going to be your tax return that reports the earnings and then you want to fill out whatever paperwork they have and then usually anything like any request usually is like three weeks later ish you'll get something in the mail with their ruling or judgment and they'll either ask you for more documents or they'll say we've corrected it so I don't want to say it's three weeks for everything, but generally I see clients, you know, being notified three, maybe three to five weeks. I'll try to French. All right. So I think there's a couple on this, a couple questions on this. Do the years worked after age 62 count in the highest 35 years, or is that the only time the earnings record is reviewed? Um, so yeah. 62 is when they do the, the initial calculation, but if you're working past 62 and it's, you know, inflation adjusted higher than some of your lower earnings years, it will benefit you and it will increase your benefit. Okay. Um, Sister-in-law is divorced after being married for more than 10 years. Um, worked at a looks um, oh worked has low income jobs and retired after working 25 years in low income jobs is she entitled to ex husband's social security rate. Um, yes, if she was married to this person for 10 years or more then and she is not remarried then yes she's entitled to a divorced spousal benefit and she would. Um, she would go to um, she can actually apply online initially um, and you can do that right on the website or you can go into the administration if you're dealing with that what you need to bring with you is a copy of or yeah, a copy of your marriage certificate and divorce documents they need proof that you are married and then they need proof that you were divorced and then you also need the ex-spouse's social security number so you can do that online or in person when will the reform options be be decided um i think you're referring to the part where i was talking about what's going on in congress uh it's unknown right ultimately it's going to be a decision that is up to congress so you know hard to say um but uh, there is some legislation that's always you know that's been there but when it's going to be uh, addressed it's hard to say um Okay, there's a two part question. Okay, if my earning during 35 years is higher than my ex husband, can I still claim for the half divorce spousal benefit? So, yeah, if you qualify for the divorce spousal benefit, you, you would take the one that's higher. So, if yours is higher, then you would keep yours. Um. Okay, this says, what about singles? Seems like a lot of the material is geared towards uh, married couples. Yes, true. So if you're, if you're a single individual and um, we're, have never been married or were married but less than for 10 years, then really you're looking at your own benefit and what is best for you in your retirement plan. Is it better for you based on your health, um, your family history, longevity, all of that. What's better? Is it better to collect early or later? We do the same analysis or we look at the same things for individuals. It's always better um, to collect later if you can, but if you need to collect early, then you'll have to, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, you, can, you can actually simply look at all of that for your own benefit on the social security site. So if, if only my husband is receiving the benefit and I'm waiting to apply later at age 70, if the husband suddenly passed away, can the wife apply for the survivor benefit? So in general, the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, and again, you know, that same rule applies is whichever one is higher, you would probably go with. The one sort of issue with this is depending on how old the wife is so if 
the wife is still working also, right, let's say, and she applies for a survivor benefit, there, that, that's all going to be subject to the earnings test. So um, her benefit, that survived benefit may not be paid. So it's a little complicated depending if the wife is still working, but generally speaking, the answer is yes, she can apply for the survivor benefit. Okay, um, right now we're gonna next ask uh, Mitchell if there are any Zoom questions. Hello, uh, there is a uh, question. Um, I am 64, still working. Uh, my current SSB is about 1800. If I decide to collect SS and remain working, I would only receive 900 question mark. I think so. I'm, the way I'm hearing that is if um, if he started or if the individual started collecting before reaching age 66 or 67, because did you say the individual was 63 or 64? Yes, 64. Okay. So what happens is that if you start collecting and you're working before full retirement age, then you're going to lose, they're going to withhold a little bit of your benefit. So you're going to um, lose, it's $1 for every $2 of your benefit is withheld over a certain amount of money. But when you, when you reach your full retirement age, that money that was withheld during those years gets filtered back into your benefit once you reach full retirement age. So it's a temporary reduction while you're under full retirement age. I truly don't know why they made that rule, but that's, that's the way it works. So ultimately you get it back. Okay, okay, okay great. Um, a few more questions here. Um, so I just had, oh, there was several questions on taxation of social security benefits. That was the one slide I skipped. Um, so the first question is, um, wait, wait, what's my question? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, the rationale behind uh, the social security taxation and its rules. Here's essentially what it is. First of all, the tax table for social security benefits hasn't been adjusted for inflation in decades. I think it was like 1980 or something like that, where the, the I can't remember the exact year. But I think it was in the 80s where they decided to start taxing Social Security benefits. And this was the original tax table, and it hasn't increased for inflation. So that's not really a good thing, right? Because these, you can see, I mean, um, for a married couple, for example, if you have over $44,000 of income, then most of your benefits going to be taxed. Um, and I don't know when they're planning to adjust it either. but. The other thing is that not all of your benefit is taxed. The most that can be taxed is 85% of your social security benefit. So like if you're collecting benefits, it will show your gross benefit and then a little, you know, to the right, it'll show the portion that's taxable. So essentially the more, like with a lot of other things, the more money that you earn, the more tax you're gonna pay. Um, that's how that works. So the question, well, the 8% COLA from 67 to 70 is good, but I would use a large amount of savings to cover. It might take 20 to 30 years until the extra monthly benefit makes up for the capital loss. How does this factor in? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I think the question is, is that, um, is the, additional benefit by delaying so so the eight percent is a delayed credit that's separate from the cost of living so the cost of living is on top of the delayed credit but whether or not it's i think the question is is it worth waiting to get a higher amount later but foregoing all of those lower amounts early right so um it's hard to say, right? So this question talks about a 20 to 30 year time period. Um, that's obviously gonna be based on assumptions on, you know, if you get the checks early, what are you gonna do with it? What kind of return are you gonna get? What your life expectancy is gonna be? I, I, I kind of go back to what I said earlier is to, there's a lot of great calculators out there that can 
sort of model these scenarios and you can see based on the assumptions that you use, you know, what that shows. And then in the end, right, all that's going to do is give you more information to make a more informed decision. But so yeah, you, you can run the numbers to see what, what comes out on this. Okay, just a few more here. Um, this one says, I'm an LA County uh, retiree and received 4,000 in pension income. So windfall elimination provision applies. Um, so you're getting 4,000 and likely not getting social security. When your spouse receives 4,000 in social security, can I receive my $2,000 spousal benefit? And do I have to apply for that benefit? So if you are already fall if you already fall under the windfall elimination provision that impacts your benefit then you're going to when your spouse um, i'm sorry when your spouse starts collecting you're then going to fall under the government offset provision which reduces or eliminates your spousal benefit so it, it covers those two provisions cover the individual and spousal benefit and and likewise um, the survivor's benefit as well so yes, um, or I guess the answer to this question is most likely you will not be able to receive the social security spousal benefits. But I do wanna say in these instances, it's always important to go to the social security administration and, and ask for a printout of what benefits you may or may not be able or in, be entitled to receive because you, don't, you never know, you know. So you always wanna get the information and have it looked at. Um, I'll just go ahead and answer this one. Okay. Um, I think this one says, so draw down an IRA to cover expenses. Um, it, I think it's basically saying that that doesn't empower or do or bode well for beneficiaries um, because Social Security cannot be inherited by a beneficiary, which is very true. That's why everyone's situation is unique. If you have, um, and I'm not going to put a dollar on this, but if you have significant resources or investments, that are set up to provide a legacy for your children or grandchildren or whomever, um, this social security question may not be as much of an issue. And maybe there is a better reason to start early and preserve those assets for beneficiaries. And that, that all depends on your estate plan. To the issue of zero income years, uh, the 35 years of income concept, please explain. Stop working at age 60, then use personal income, zero yearly income occurs. How to calculate the best time to wait for starting Social Security benefits. So um, it sounds like this is kind of a general question. So the yeah, so to kind of recap, your benefit is based upon the 35 highest uh, earnings years based index for inflation. So depending on how many years that you have Social Security wages, right? If you have 35 then you, years, you won't have any zero years. If you have less than 35 years, you'll have some zero years. So obviously zero when they feed that into the computer for earnings, right, that's going to reduce in a lower benefit. So that's what we're talking about is, well, if there's, if there's an opportunity to work, continue working, right, you'll be replacing those zero years with a year of earnings. So that could increase your, your benefit. Now, whether that increase is worth working those other years, right, you, you'd have to look at that closer, but that's really what, what the concept is, um, and again, sort of how to calculate the best time to wait for or when to start. I mean, I, I kind of go back to sort of the general uh, recommendation to, you know, tie that into a retirement plan, a financial plan, because that by completing one of those plans, that will answer those questions because it's going to say, well, you know, when when are you hoping to retire? you know, will these strategies support that, et cetera. So it's really a function of, you know, doing the planning, putting a plan together, using the social security calculators to help you 
with that piece of the overall plan. So. Um, okay, and then I think this is our last one. Um, let's see. Oh, um, what if I take Social Security early and invest it? Can I get better returns? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I um, so I think um, it's always a risk. I mean, that's you know, investing is always a risk. So I know that with Social Security, if you delay benefits from full retirement age to 70, that you're guaranteed the 8%, 8% plus cost of living, which is about 10 and a half percent. And like I said, I, I would never be able to guarantee that year over year for three or four years back to back. It would be very nice to be able to guarantee that, but we can't do that. So that would be a risk that you'd have to be willing to take. That's my answer. <laughs> How is the Social Security Trust Fund being invested currently? Um, that's a good question. I actually know no one's ever asked that before. I, I'm not sure specifically. I would say it's it's going to be very conservative, um, but I, I don't know that answer myself. Does the person receiving survivor benefits have to have paid into Social Security? For example, city employees don't pay any Social Security taxes. So, okay, so there, there's kind of two parts. So generally speaking, you can be receive survivor benefits and not have paid into Social Security, right? That, so you don't need to necessarily. Um, however, right, if you are receiving a, a pension, this, this goes back to the um, government pension offset uh, uh, rule where Potentially, if you have a, receiving a pension from and haven't paid into Social Security, right, that may impact any survivor benefits that you get. So that that's something you'd have to look at. But in general, let's say there's a survivor who never worked at a company where they paid in, did not pay into Social Security, yes, they could still receive a survivor benefit. I think that's it. Oh, Mitchell. Oh, all right. Well, thanks so much, Larry and Kristen. Let's give them another round of applause for a great presentation. It's. Um, I'm going to see if I can advance here. If there were any questions we didn't get to, then um, I put my email address up there on the screen. You can send them to me and I can get answers from Kristen and Larry for you on that. So, um, and, and Zoomers, that is helpful for you too, probably. So we did have some extra handouts today. And so they are on the back. If you'd like to take one on your way out, an extra one you wanna share with someone, we did record this seminar and so we will be able we will be posting that on our website next week sometime I will email everyone who was here and everyone who registered so you're able to share that with a friend and uh, or you know look at it again yourself if there are additional questions. If you would take a minute to complete the evaluation form with your handouts today it's really helpful to hear your feedback on this, any uh, requests for future topics. We uh, will soon be planning next year's seminars and so, excuse me, so we'd like to hear from you on what you'd like to hear about. Um, our next month on our, in two months on July 13 is our seminar on boot camp for the executor. It's not the executor, but the executor. So that is, um, if you're named to be the, you know, responsible for settling someone's estate, we have Suzanne Grodnitsky, a professional fiduciary, and Stephanie Besner, an attorney, who will be presenting on that. And they're going to go through some basics. The, you have a flyer on that, so you see what the points are. And then we'll wrap up this year's uh, list with, in, on September 14 with straight talk about estate planning with attorneys Eric Harris and Greg Becker. So they're going to just come and give, you know, to some, some pitfalls and, uh, you know, just give some basics, too, about what it means to have an estate plan in place. So that is going to be a, a real good one. So now it's time to give out the door prizes.
And so did everyone get a red ticket when you came in? Is there anyone, raise your hand if you didn't get a ticket? I, Denise in the back is going to pass the bowl, but it looks like everybody did. So, um, and thank you to my helpers from the audience who are going to help pass these out. Um, Brenda and, and uh, Edward are going to help with that. Our, the other PAC members who were here earlier, they all had other commitments. They had to leave early. So um, thank you to my volunteers here who agreed to help. So I'm going to have Kristen and Larry pick some tickets. All right, and I, I broke up 100 tickets and there are a little over 50 people in the room, so we might not have any winners with this. So our first one is for a Regal um, $15 gift card for anybody who likes to go to the movies, and the Regal is up on the hill. So how about the last four digits are 447? We have a winner over there. Okay, great. And anybody, and then we have AMC for fifteen dollars. So another uh, for another movie uh, um, opportunity. How about the last three digits being five oh five? Five oh five in the room? Nope. How about five one seven? Oh, are you five oh five? Okay, very good. So let's give out ten dollars to Starbucks to that five one seven. Is five one seven in the room? There, Ali got it. That's great. Ali's first time here and he, he's a winner. So that's awesome. Then one more, we have Amazon $10 and that would go to 481. And that she's over there. Wow. Good job, you guys. They, they picked uh, all the tickets who uh, that were selected today. So um, anyway, that wraps it up for today. Thank you so much for coming. I wish you all a wonderful rest of the weekend and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the audience. Take care.